Okay, good morning to everyone. No? And uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Brian. And thank you also to Gabriel and to Frances and Hannah and to the organizers of this Beyond Porsyong Pulano. And I'm happy that uh, we were, you were able to accommodate this last topic, no, which I think is um, a very important uh, information as part of the history of the Capuchins in the Philippines. So let me just share my slides. So our title, as has been mentioned already, is the Nuestra Señora de Guía and the uh, Capuchins. No? Uh, apparently, this is uh, a lesser known information in the history of the Capuchins in the Philippines. And as has been mentioned earlier, no? so this Beyond Porsion Cola project is still in the context of the celebration of our 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines, which will be ending this coming April 22, 2022. And uh, a significant part of this uh, celebration uh, after the arrival of Christianity in the Philippines in 1521 would be uh, a few years later, no? several years later, with the arrival of Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. No? Uh, the arrival of Legazpi in the Philippines has been marked by we can say two important uh, religious occurrences. The first one was the discovery of the Santo Nino de Cebu in, on April 28, 1565. It was discovered by one of his soldiers, uh, Juan Camus, in a hut uh, that was spared of the fire that uh, resulted into the uh, battle that has happened. No? And uh, this has become a significant experience for Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, no? to the point that when he wrote to the king no? to ask for assistance, he said, no? I beg his majesty to send us some aid because it is worth knowing and so that your excellency may understand that God, our Lord, had waited for us in this place. No? So, the, the finding of the image was uh, interpreted as, as if God has been here in our country and has been waiting for, for this, um, well, conquerors, but at the same time, they also have missionaries with them who are supposed to spread the Christian faith. So that is what happened in, in Cebu. No? Now, uh, several years later, no, when... Uh, Legaspe decided to extend uh, and go to the other parts of the archipelago. No? Uh, he heard about this island Luzon no? and <clears throat> he wanted to, to go there also. No? And when he arrived in Manila on May 19, 1571, one of the members of his uh, troops no? who was walking along the bay of uh, the shore of Manila Bay, no? found this group of natives who were worshipping an image no? uh, atop a pandan trunk no? and surrounded by pandan plants, no? the, the shrub. No? And uh, what happened would be, uh, that's what we will share later. No? So the finding of the image of the Nuestra Señora de Guía, so that is the image that came to be known later, and the finding of the Santo Nino de Cebu were interpreted as heavenly pledges, no? that God is blessing their, their mission here in the Philippines. No? And that's why I think it's very important for us to, to see that context and the involvement and the relationship of the Capuchins later on, many centuries later, to the Nuestra Señora de Guía. The finding of the Nuestra Señora de Guía is uh, documented in this uh, what we call Annales Ecclesiasticos de Filipinas. No? And what is this document? 
So it is a chronicle of the activities of the archdiocese of archbishops of Manila, no? the bishops and archbishops, and it was a kind of journal of its own time. No? And we will find the account of the finding of the image of the Nuestra Señora de Guia under the portions when where it discussed uh, what we call the primeros provisores y vicarios generales, and they were talking about Fray Andres de Urdaneta, the Augustinian missionary who was with uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, <clears throat> and also about Don Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. <clears throat> and what do we see in that account? So as I have mentioned earlier, uh, one of the soldiers who was uh, wading through the shore to the, to the Navy boat found the miraculous image of the Nuestra Señora de Guia in a clump of pandanes or palmillas, no? shrubs. No? So the popular belief among the natives, however, was that they had found the image previously and that they kept it for many years, venerating the statue as a divine object, particularly because the image was believed to possess divine and miraculous powers. Popular stories have it that no matter how much and how often they tried, the natives could never succeed in removing the statue from the original place where it was found. It was said that whenever anyone carried it away, the image would always miraculously return to the same place. So apparently that place where they, they found the image, uh, they tried to put her somewhere else but would always miraculously return there no and presently uh within that vicinity was uh established the what we see now as the church of the nuestra senora de guia so the discovery of the miraculous image was triumphantly observed with a solemn procession which enshrined the statue in the parish church of manila so Miguel Lopez de Legazpi founded a church. No? Uh, of course, it was a very simple construction during that time. Uh, and it was put under the advocation of the Immaculate Conception. And later on, uh, this became what we call now the Manila Cathedral. So that's the first uh, parish in, in the Philippines, in Manila. No? And that's why we call Manila Cathedral now as the mother church in the Philippines. So here the image was kept until it was transferred to a wooden temple. And of course, according to that uh, account, it, it was now a made of stone, no? uh, <clears throat> built a short distance from the site where it was found. It was from this temple or shrine that Our Lady began to spread the rays of her charity on numerous occasions to the benefit of all, but most especially of, to the sailors. Because of this, she was accorded the title of Guia and was also made the patroness of the Spanish galleons. The two cabildos, the cabildos are the chapter no? or the council. No? So the two cabildos referred here would be the council of the governor and the council of the, the, the church, the parish or the cathedral. No? Uh, so they agreed to celebrate her feast jointly the secular clergy was given the charge of her shrine and its first chaplain was the licentiate Bivaneta, who was succeeded for many years by the prebendaries of the cathedral. No? And of course, in the history of the Church of Manila, the first uh, bishop assigned was uh, Bishop Domingo de, La de Salazar, a Dominican, no? who arrived uh, in Manila and founded the Manila Cathedral on September 21, 1581. So when Legazpi took possession of Manila and established the Iglesia Parroquial de Bajo de la Advocación de la Purísima Concepción de Nuestra Señora, that was on June 24, 1571. No? And uh, that was the first home of the image of the Nuestra Señora de Guia. And later, uh, when there was already a, a, a chapel in, in the place where she was found, 
she was brought there and later it became the Ermita Church. <clears throat> so last year, uh, the parish of Ermita celebrated the 450th year of the finding of the image. So it was uh, coinciding also with our 500 years of Christianity. You know? So uh, 50 years ago, in 1971, they celebrated the 400 years. <clears throat> and it was uh, this occasion uh, when I was invited to give a sort of historical Marian recollection about the Nuestra Señora de Guía that I realized and found out that there are still a lot of stories and historical facts that we have not heard about the Nuestra Señora de Guía. And among that also, we can number the contribution and the relationship of the Capuchins to the Nuestra Señora de Guía. But at this point, I think it would be good for us to make a, a short reflection on, on them because we know there are many Marian titles of Our Lady just here in the country. And if you go outside the country, there is much more. No? And right now, uh, with the Marian titles associated with the Capuchins, at least we have the, uh, the patroness of the Capuchins in the Philippines, the Divina Pastora. And then, of course, the, the National Shrine, the patroness of the National Shrine, Our Lady of Lourdes. And now we see the connection of the Capuchins with the Nuestra Señora de Guía. And Pope Francis had a, a beautiful reflection about these Marian titles. No? And he said, Christian piety always give her beautiful titles just as a son gives them to his mother. How many beautiful things a son says to his mother whom he loves so much. How many beautiful things. But we must be careful. The things the church and the saints say, the beautiful things they say to Mary, don't take, and don't take anything away from the redeeming uniqueness of Christ. He is the only redeemer. They are expressions of love that a son says to his mother. They may be exaggerated, but we know love leads us to do exaggerated things. But they come from love. So as mentioned earlier, we are called a Pueblo Amante de Maria. And it is exactly this, our great love for the Blessed Virgin Mary, that has led us to realize that she plays different and various roles in our life, especially as Christians. And that's why the titles would try to capture these different varied experiences of Our Lady and would lead us to call her with this title or that title. Now, I would just like to make mention of uh, this uh, Archbishop of uh, Manila, no? Archbishop de la Cuesta, because uh, he is one of the Archbishops of Manila that had a great devotion to Our Lady of the Guia, no? uh, to the point that he had his church, her church, uh, rebuilt and uh, had it uh, ornamented and really turned it into a very beautiful sanctuary. No? And uh, this is the illustration of the facade of the church that Archbishop de la Cuesta had built for Our Lady. No? Because uh, we're skipping that part of the history of Our Lady of the Guia that her church has always been uh, a victim of destruction, no? Uh, if not uh, earthquake, uh, invasion, uh, there was a time when with the threat of the invasion from the, the British, no? They had to, the governor ordered that the stone structure around Intramuros, which is a cannonball uh, throw away should be demolished, no? And one of that would be the Church of the Nuestra Señora de Guía, no? Because they don't want the structures, the stone structures, to become the defenses of the enemies who would like to attack Intramuros, no? 
Now, Archbishop de la Cuesta, out of his devotion to Our Lady, had this beautiful church made for her. No? Unfortunately, this beautiful church was destroyed during the earthquake of uh, 1771. No? And the Nuestra Señora de Guía had to be transferred to the cathedral. Now, it's also important to note that, as mentioned earlier, the cathedral or when it was just a parish church in back in the 1500s no was the first home of our lady because she did not have any chapel or church in the in ermita area where she was found no actually the name came to be called ermita because of the chapel that was built for our lady which in spanish is called ermit <coughs> ermita no or hermitage now Every time there is a threat to the Church of Ermita uh, from the time it has been constructed, the Our Lady will always be brought to the cathedral for safekeeping. On another occasion, uh, because she has been the patroness of the galleons, no? so when they had to invoke her because a gal there's no news about the galleon, no? what happened to it? Is it already returning to the Philippines or has it already reached Acapulco? So what they would do is to bring her image to the cathedral and then they would perform a novena. No? And uh, according to the accounts, even before the novena ended, there is already news of where the galleon or how the galleon is doing. No? <clears throat> so those are the instances when the lady, the image of Our Lady, will have to be brought to the Manila Cathedral. No? Now, it is important to know at this point that when the image was transferred to the Manila Cathedral <clears throat> in 1771, it was not returned for a long time. Actually, it took a century and a half, almost a century and a half, <clears throat> before the image could be returned to Ermita. So she has been away from her uh, church, no? her own church in Ermita, where she was found for a long, long time. Okay. And it is at this point that um, the recollects will come in. No? Uh, because after the church has been destroyed, <clears throat> of course, there were efforts to rebuild it. <clears throat> but it was the recollect fathers who administered Ermita from 1873 to 1898, no? uh, who had a, a beautiful church made no? in 1865 under the <clears throat> recollect uh, Fray Santos Paredes. No? And it has been called one of the be most beautiful uh, church in, in, in Manila. No? <clears throat> but you will notice here that it is no longer made of stone no? uh, because of that instruction that uh, it's not allowed to build uh, high stone edifices around Intramuros. No? And of course, because this is still part of the, the latter years of the Spanish colonial rule in the Philippines, so that uh, rule still applies. No? So it's a, a, a much uh, lower church. No? It's not as high as the one that you have seen earlier. No? the one that was uh, built by uh, Archbishop de la Cuesta. And it was also Father or Fray Santos Paredes no? uh, who uh, beautified the church. No? And this is the, an old picture of the interior of the church. And it is also Fray Santos Paredes, who made the first effort to have the image, the original image of Our Lady of the Guia returned to Ermita. No? So uh, he's, he made the petition through his letter of September 18, 1891 to Archbishop Bernardino Nosaleda, a Dominican, who, is, who was Archbishop of Manila. However, nothing turned out of these efforts, no? despite his uh, pleadings and his petition. No? So this is the 
copy of the letter that he wrote that was provided to me by the archivist of the Recollect, Father Emil Kilata. So after the Recollects, no? uh, so the, the, during the time of the Recollects, the Virgin of the Guia remained in Manila Cathedral. And this is uh, one of the old pictures of Our Lady while she was at the Manila Cathedral. No? So maybe you'll notice that there seems to be a resemblance between the main altar of the cathedral, especially the, the canopy that houses the uh, Virgin, no? and also the sanctuary of the Church of Ermita. Now, after the recollects came in the capuchins, no? and for this part, and this is the heart of my sharing this morning because of our focus on the contributions of the Capuchins. So I am so happy to have discovered uh, this uh, work of uh, Father Bienvenido de Arbeza, no? a Capuchin, no? Reseña Historica de los Capuchinos en Filipinas, no? although it's written in, in Spanish. No? And when I was at the uh, Capuchin archives, no, through the kindness of Father Perlado, no, uh, I was able to see this uh, sort of souvenir book, the 100 years Capuchin presence in the Philippines. So most of the information that I will be sharing uh, will be coming from these two very important sources. Now, it was the uh, administrator of uh, Manila, Archbishop Martin Garcia de Alcocer, uh, who is an of, uh, OFM discussed, no? who was Archbishop of Cebu and administering Manila. He was the one who requested the Capuchins to administer the parish of Ermita. So it was the first parish accepted by the Capuchins in the Philippines with its church almost in ruins at that time. No? So the first parish priest was Father Mariacan on the Olot who took possession of the parish on May 31. No? And it was a Pentecost Sunday. No? So at a glance, these are the Capuchins, around 16 of them, no? 16 because uh, one Capuchin, that's uh, Father uh, Guernica, Father Guernica, who was assigned uh, twice, no? uh, but there are around 16 Capuchins who serve as, as parish priests of Ermita. One of the contributions that was mentioned in that uh, souvenir book on the presence, 100 years presence of the Capuchin in the Philippines was the establishment of Ermita Catholic School that is considered the first parochial school in the Philippines. No? So in 1903, during the American occupation, Father Mariano de Olot built a beautiful school at the courtyard of the parish with the uh, money donated by the Archbishop of Manila. And uh, so that's the Reverend uh, Jeremiah Harty. No? And the school was recognized and praised by the government. And uh, uh, it offered free schooling to a good number of boys and girls. No? And according to the account also, the Capuchins engaged themselves in the teaching of catechism in this school. And it was also said that it was a challenge to maintain the school because it is a free school. It offers free education and is uh, living out uh, through the donations that uh, are given by the benefactors. During World War II in 1944, it was uh, completely destroyed and it was rebuilt three years later by Father Blas de Guernica together with the uh, provisional church that was later converted into the high school building of Ermita. 
so the capuchins uh, taught catechism daily in that school so that is their their form of evangelization in this school another important source that i was able to find no is the only i can say the only booklet about the nuestra señora de guia and it was written by the jesuit uh, father uh, miguel sadera maso no uh, in 1923 so that was the time when the capuchins were ministering at ermita so that's why uh, this work is very important because it gave us a glimpse of uh, what is happening to Ermita during the time of the Capuchins. No? And from this work, we can see, uh, these are the pictures no, from that book. No? It's still almost the same church as the one um, built by the Recollects. No? And as mentioned, because it was in a sort of a sad state, the Capuchins tried to rebuild it, no? tried to refurnish it. No? and uh, in a way maintain it according to its uh, original uh, condition as built by the Recollects. No? This is also the picture of the convento or the parish uh, rectory no? during the time of the Capuchins. No? So we are assuming uh, it's the time of the Capuchins because it was written in 1923. So uh, the pictures are supposed to date to that time so that was the time of the capuchins so at this point it is important to know that the efforts of the capuchin it was through the efforts of the capuchin that the return of the original image of the nuestra senora de guia materialized no and uh in 1908 when uh Archbishop Jeremiah James Harty was uh, the one uh, occupying the Sea of Manila. So the initial efforts were made. First, it was Father Ricardo de Torres, who gathered hundreds of signatures among the parishioners to claim their right to the Virgin of Ermita. And it was followed um, years later by uh, Father Emilio de Papiol and Father Marcelino de Sol. So the the succeeding parish priest of Ermita uh, continued that effort to petition for the return of the image of Our Lady of the Guia. So just to give a face to the names that we have mentioned, so this is uh, Father Ricardo de Torres and Father Emilio de Papiol. No? And I thank uh, Ed Chico for helping me acquire the pictures from the capuchin archive so at least <clears throat> there would be a face to the name of these capuchins assigned in ermita unfortunately of course the the pictures are not that clear no because uh maybe of the printing no uh, the original <clears throat> source of this picture now finally uh, it was Father Vicente de Pamplona uh, who was able to succeed in petitioning because there was also the new Archbishop of Manila, the Archbishop uh, Michael Odoherty. No? And uh, the first success of uh, Father de Pamplona was to have the provisional return, the temporary return of the image to Ermita, no? After his petition to Archbishop Odoherty, no? <clears throat> and this is Father Vicente de Pamplona. No? So again, from the Capuchin archives. And I was happy to, to find a sort of uh, account of this uh, initial return of Our Lady, no? As, as, as I was trying to make a research, I encountered this uh, book. It's about the letters of the Jesuits. No? Uh, it's called Cartas Edificantes. No? 
of the a compilation of the letters written by Jesuits, no? And in this letter of uh, Brother Joaquin Lim, <clears throat> a Jesuit novice, to Louis Paking, also another, another Jesuit novice <clears throat> who was in Veruela, Spain, no? So he made an account of their experience, no? That uh, they were just walking outside, but they were brought eventually to the cathedral and uh, they chanced upon the procession that is about to begin and that is meant to transfer the image of Our Lady of the Guia to Ermita Church from the Manila Cathedral. So this is the <clears throat> temporary return in 1917 December. And the two brothers, or the, the, the brother, no, uh, was able to walk just right after the, the carriage, um, carrying the image of Our Lady. No? And of course, uh, he mentioned that along the way, they had to stop uh, because people were waving their hands, no, welcoming Our Lady. No? And uh, they went through Luneta until they reached... Uh, uh, Ermita, no, and uh, there were rituals performed, such as offering of flowers to Our Lady, and there was also uh, a speech, no, yeah, given by the famous uh, Catholic uh, author, also Don Manuel Rabago, <clears throat> before the image was um, brought inside the church, no, and they had the Te Deum, no, and it started the novena, no. And the Jesuits also were part of that uh, novena. No? Uh, they celebrated the uh, novena masses. No? So this happened in December of 1917. Now, the following year, <clears throat> 1918, no? Father de Pamplona took advantage of the initial permission to allow the temporary return of the image to Ermita, no? And he had meetings with the Archbishop and also with the Cabildo or the Cathedral Chapter you know, because they had to make their recommendation also to the Archbishop regarding the petition of uh, the Ermita Parish, no? And eventually, no? And the positive result of this request was the decree that was uh, issued by Archbishop Odo Herty, uh, dated November 27, 1918, and it was issued uh, the following day, November 28. No? And here is the, the translation of that decree because it was written in Spanish no? as uh, based on the accounts no, that I found. No? So the Archbishop had uh, allowed the provisional return until it is um, uh, confirmed no? uh, so that the Virgin will now be brought back to her home parish, the Ermita Church. No? And it stipulated the date of the return no? on December 17, 1918. And with this decree, of course, the people of Ermita were very happy. And I, I believe they are very thankful to the Capuchins for being able to uh, persist no? and to be patient in making the request repeatedly to the Archbishop of Manila. No? And so together... Uh, with the image and all her jewels and vestments, so what we can call the treasure of the Virgin, all of these were returned to Ermita on December 17, 1918. I would like to think this, is, this was a more uh, jubilant celebration, but unfortunately, I was not able to find any account na similar to what the <clears throat> Jesuit brother uh, wrote in his letter in 1917. No? And uh, apparently there was a replica of the Virgin of Ermita that was enshrined in Ermita Church in the absence of the original image. And what happened was that this 
image copy of the Nuestra Señora de Guía was uh, given to the cathedral. No? And the original uh, is brought back to Ermita Church. No? So it's important to note that it was through the, uh, thanks to the skillful efforts <coughs> carried out by the parish priest of Ermita for almost 20 years. So that has been the patience no, of the Capuchins. They did not give up until finally the petition was granted. No? And I think this is one of the, uh, aside from the establishment of the first Catholic school, no, parochial school, in regarding this uh, most, uh, the, the oldest Marian image in the Philippines, this is again the, the first contribution of the Capuchins with regards to the parish of Ermita. No? Now, during World War II, of course, the Church of Ermita was not spared. We know that a lot of churches in Intramuros and outside, and even in the provinces, suffered a lot no? and were destroyed no? during the World War II. Now, the saving of the image of Our Lady of the Gia was made possible through the foresight of the parish priest then, Father Blas de Guernica. No? So a few years, a few weeks before the liberation of Manila, so he together with uh, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Justo Lopez, no? they buried the image in one of the niches of the crypt at the back of the main altar. No? And the niche was closed with a large marble slab. So this is to protect the, the image, no? Uh, the crib was damaged, but the image was saved, no? And some would say this was really a miraculous occurrence, no? Because we cannot really say uh, how the bombs will, for example, damage a structure, no? So three days after the Americans entered Ermita in 1945, Father Guernica, accompanied by his uh, curate, Father Rogelio de Bedonia, and a chaplain of uh, the American army and four, four soldiers removed the rubble and found the image intact. So they took her from there to the house of Don Claudio Lusuriaga uh, along Taft Avenue, one of the few houses that remained standing in that area. No? And it is here that we will see the, the journey of Our Lady, no? Uh, according to the account, no, it sought refuge in the house of the Moses girl in San Miguel de Mayumo in Bulacan. No? And I was uh, happy to find this account um, in the work of uh, Resenia. No? And I was happy also to locate one of the uh, family members, no? of the Moses Geld, no? <clears throat> and uh, it was uh, Simon Monchito Moses Geld, uh, the great-great-grandson of uh, the patriarch of the Moses Geld, Simon Moses Geld, no? <clears throat> where the image took refuge in San Miguel de Mayumo. And he shared to me this old, old family picture where you will see the patriarch, Simon Moses Geld. And why the Moses Geld? Because the camarera, the long-standing camarera or caretaker of the Virgin at that time was Doña Potenciana Font. No? Uh, Doña Potenciana Font was the sister-in-law of Simon Moses Geld and she lived with the Moses Geld. So that explains why uh, it was under the care of the family that the Virgin uh, sought refuge in San Miguel de Mayumo. But later on, the image was uh, transferred back to Manila, to Capo Church. No? Uh, for those who know the history also of the Virgin of Antipolo, I have a book about the Virgin of Antipolo. The Virgin of Antipolo eventually sought refuge, mm -hmm. refuge also in Capo Church before she was returned to Antipolo during World War II. No? And from Quiapo, uh, Our Lady of the Guia was transferred two years later in a solemn procession to Ermita Church. And she was received by Monsignor uh, Jovellanos, the Vicar General of Manila, 
and also an ermitense. No? And uh, Monsignor Hubellanos made a written declaration on December 10, 1945 about the miraculous survival of the Virgin's image during World War II. And uh, after the war, so in 1947, Father Guernica was able to build a provisional church, which was uh, blessed on July 21 of the same year. So this is a much simpler church because it was just uh, a provisional church and they hope to, to build a, a better church later no? when the time will already allow them. So after a few years, um, I think this is uh, this is still the present Ermita Church, which uh, I think really dates back to the time when the Capuchins had it, had it built, no, in the 1940s or late 1940s to early 1950s, no, and uh, this will usher us in to the next important uh, event in the history of the image of Our Lady of Tequila. So now that she has uh, uh, a proper church no, for her to be venerated, it seems that there's still one more thing lacking. No? And that is the recognition of a coronation to Our Lady of the Guia. In 1955, no, that was the time when the Our Lady was granted this, what we call the pontifical coronation. Mm -hmm. It was Archbishop Rufino Santos uh, who we could say made that petition no, to the Holy See. No? And uh, the pontifical rescript or the decree from Rome came from the office of uh, Federico Cardinal Tedeschini and it was issued according to an account that I found on December 6, 1955. And uh, uh, it's worth noting that Our Lady also was called Our Lady of Expectation. Uh, in that document because uh, in the Spanish times, the Feast of Our Lady of the Guia is during the Feast of the Expectation of Our Lady. That's December 18, a few days before Christmas. At this point, I think it's important to note that the widespread practice of crowning images of Our Lady in the Catholic Church came also from a Capuchin. No? It was the pastoral practice of Fra Girolamo Paolucci. No? He lived in, in Carboli da Forli in Italy from 1552 to 1620. And he has been called the Apostle of Our Lady. No? So what uh, Fra Girolamo Paolucci would do at that time, whenever he would have a cycle of uh, catechesis and evangelization in a certain place, he would culminate that the cycle of uh, catechism uh, with the coronation of an image of Our Lady. And usually the crown that is used to, to, that is placed on the image of Our Lady came from the donation of money or jewels of the people who were uh, listening to him. And uh, they would made a crown out make a crown out of that uh, contributions and donations. So apparently, that practice uh, got the inspiration of uh, Count Alessandro uh, Desforza Palavicino, and he was the one who uh, made a donation to the <coughs> Vatican chapter because he believes that it should be the Vatican who should <coughs> pronounce which image should be given uh, coronation in the name and by the authority of the Pope. So what were the requisites for this coronation? No? First is the antiquity of the image. And of course, we know that the Nuestra Señora de Guía is the oldest modern image in the Philippines. But I, I got a question. No? Uh, if she is the oldest, how come she was not the first image to be crowned in the Philippines? Because the first coronation happened in 1907 with the image of the Our Lady of Lanabal, no? of Santo Domingo Church. No? Uh, apparently, I think uh, a big factor to this would be the absence of Our Lady in Ermita and her stay in the cathedral for uh, a century and a half. 
The other uh, requirements are the fervent devotion lasting through time. Uh, and we know that the Virgin of Ermita has been invoked as patroness of the Galleon since the Spanish time. <clears throat> and prodigiousness, no? as attested by miracle. So these are the three requisites that uh, the Vatican look for before allowing an image to be crowned in the name and by the authority of the Pope. And so um, we can find an account of the coronation of Our Lady uh, from the Bulletin Ecclesiastico de Filipinas and also the Sentinel, an old periodical, and the Santo Rosario magazine. No? So what happened? Uh, the coronation took place on December 30, 1951. Uh, the Virgin was brought out of her church to the what we call now the Plaza de Ermita. It was it used to be called Plaza Ferguson during that time, and the coronation happened in that place so that more people can be accommodated. Uh, there were many important people present in that uh, event. No. Uh, of course, the Apostolic Nuncio was the one who conferred or uh, conducted the coronation. That's uh, uh, Monsignor Egidio Bagnozzi. No? And uh, the one who carried the crown was the Spanish ambassador at that time, no? uh, Senor Fermin uh, Sanz de Orillo. No? And of course, this happened during the time of the Capuchins. No? And maybe we can say this is one of the crowning glory of administration of Ermita. Unfortunately, this was not mentioned uh, in the two sources that I found. That's the Resenia and the uh, 100 years presence in the Philippines. No? And uh, that's why I think it's important to highlight this also because this happened during the time of the Capuchins uh, when they were administering Ermita Church. So these are just a few pictures that I was able to retrieve from the archives of the Capuchins. Again, thanks to Father Paul Perlado no, for uh, helping me get access. So this is the procession bringing Our Lady to the place of uh, coronation. That's the Plaza Ferguson. Monsignor Bagnozzi is uh, prominently seen, uh, the one wearing the mitre. So these are the other participants in that procession. This is the choir, as you can see, being led also by a capuchin. This is the Spanish ambassador carrying the, the golden crown with precious stones. And this is the picture of the actual coronation of Our Lady by Monsignor Egidio Bagnozzi. No? So during that time, she was the eighth Marian image to be crowned in the Philippines since 1907. So after the coronation, there was a procession back to the church with uh, Monsignor Bagnozzi and the image no? being brought in procession back to the church. In 1956, Father Carlos de Urzainki and his assistant, Father Julio de Narque, were able to build and inaugurate the present church. No? So... Apparently, it was not yet fully finished no, uh, during the coronation, but they were able to finally finish it. No? With the new, new church barely, barely a year old, the Capuchins voluntarily returned the parish to the Archdiocese of Manila at the end of May 1957. Uh, Father Adolfo de Echabari, the custos at that time, wrote, no? Although hard and painful to the fathers, who have worked for more than 50 years in Ermita, we think more in accordance with our duty in the Philippines to help her found the new rather than enjoy the success so well earned. And I think this is in a way very much in line with one of the 
the thrust no, of the capuchins in terms of minority. No? So in their simplicity and humility, no, they uh, instead of enjoying that success, they would rather move on to find new uh, mission no? and entrust what they have gained already to the back to the Archdiocese of Manila. So that ended the administration of the Capuchin in Ermita. And uh, I think it was turned over to the secular priest of the Archdiocese of Manila. So just to again give face to the name. So this is Farlet, Father Carlos de Urzainki and Father Adolfo de Echavari from the Capuchin Archive. So just to give face also to the titles of the books that I have written no, that was mentioned at the start during the introduction. So these are the books on the Holy Week processions, the original Tagalog or Filipino version and the English translation. I think they're still available through Shapi and Claritian publications. This is the, the book on crowning images where I mentioned uh, Fra Girolamo Paolucci, a uh, Capuchin no, who gave inspiration to the, this practice of crowning Marian images. This is the book on the Our Lady of Antipolo, Morena Graciosa. No? Uh, I think the, the most complete history so far no, about the Virgin of Antipolo. Uh, this is another... Um, Marian image of uh, Franciscan origin. No? So this is under the care of the Franciscans in St. Anthony Shrine in Sampaloc, Manila, the Virgen Peregrina. No? That has also a rich and colorful history from Madrid to the Philippines. And these are my two books that came out last year, Place Me With Your Son. This is about the Marian images brought or introduced by the Jesuits in the Philippines. There are around 17 of them. And Coronadas, this is the updated uh, compilation of the pontifical coronations of the images of Our Lady in the Philippines from 1907 to uh, 2021. And of course, included here would be the Nuestra Señora de Guía, and the more recent coronation of Our Lady of Lourdes, of the National Shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes. So as we end this uh, sharing no, this morning, let us entrust the Capuchins in the Philippines to the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of the Good Shepherd, who gave birth to Christ, the light and salvation of all nations, and who, on the morning of Pentecost, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, presided in prayer at the dawn of evangelization. And we pray, Hail, O Lady, Mary, Holy Mother of God, you are the Virgin and made church, and the, cho and the one chosen by the Most Holy Father in heaven whom he consecrated with his most holy beloved son and with the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete, in whom there was and is the fullness of grace and ever every good. Hail his palace. Hail his tabernacle. Hail his home. Hail his robe. Hail his servant. Hail his mother. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Maraming salamat po sa kanilang lahat. We have a question, uh, Sir Micah, from... Uh, John Brian Cabahog of the USD History Society, he would like to ask, uh, ano daw po yung basis nyo in saying that Ermita Catholic School is the first parochial school because uh, before the educational reforms of 1863, there were parochial schools run by parish priests? I think I, I got it from 
that uh, souvenir book about the 100 years presence of of the capuchins in the Philippines. No? Uh, because uh, the parochial schools were not really part of the research, no. But uh, in the article that I saw in that souvenir program, I think that was uh, what was said. No, it was the first parochial school at that time. No, so I am not aware of any other parochial school that claims to be the first. But that's just based on what I I saw in that uh, souvenir program about the capuchins in the Philippines. I see. Yeah, but of course, you know, because uh, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's important because you know, we see here, you know, that it, beyond you know, the, the fact or the fact or the idea, you know, since, uh, uh, we see here you know, the, the, uh, the effort you know, that the Capuchins poured, you know, in, in building communities uh, and of course, your connection nila with uh, Mother Mary, you know. Um, speaking of which, uh, sir, you've always pointed out, no, kanina, sir, you pointed it out in previous lectures also, di ba, when, when you delivered lectures uh, at the Ateneo, you also pointed out how the, uh, our experience, no, of uh, our faith, our devotion to the Blessed Mother has led us to uh, giving her various titles and over time, diba, sir, they have persisted. Our faith has persisted. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, sa tingin nyo, sir, may saan kaya nahugot ng mga Pilipino yung ganitong klaseng palanampalataya, yung malalim na talagang nakikita sa pang-araw-araw na pabubuhay? You know, because, you know, the fact that we have various titles of the Blessed Virgin just shows that our experience is very deep. Sa po, sa, sa tingin nyo na uhugot yun ng mga Pilipino? First, uh, siguro, balikan natin yung nakikita natin sa salaysay ng Ebanghelyo. No? In the Gospels, we have seen how the Virgin Mary has played, although silent, uh, a role in the ministry of Jesus. And of course, the often repeated story about that was the wedding at Cana, no? When uh, Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, found out that the, the, the newlyweds ran out of wine, that was a concern for her because in the Jewish tradition, uh, to be running out of wine during a wedding feast uh, will be a shame no, to, the, to the host, no? And... Uh, we have that concern, no? and that's why we say that if we want uh, to our our needs to be attended, we can approach Our Lady, no, so that we can get the assistance from Christ. Now, in the Philippines, no, we have seen also the in the history of the Nuestra Señora de Guía as the oldest Marian image. So, we have seen that uh, coinciding or together with the finding of an image of Our Lord in the uh, rep as represented by the Santo Niño de Cebu, uh, there was also a Marian image that was found. No? Although uh, originally it was not uh, considered a Marian image, but they say it was the missionaries who gave it uh, an identity as the Marian image. So in the history of Christianity in the Philippines, uh, the evangelization brought by the missionaries were already accompanied by a Marian devotion. That's the Nuestra Señora de Guía. And our bishops has recognized this fact. No? First, uh, they say that we are a maternal society. No? We are a maternal, maternal culture. We give importance to the role of mothers in our life. We call the, our mothers the ilaw ng tahana. No? And if there is something uh, good news or bad news that happened to to the son, to the children, to the daughters, no? Some, most of the time, they would always uh, approach first their mother. No? And that's why our bishops also recognize that in our approach to Jesus, it has always been through Mary. Although we can always approach Jesus directly, but the role of the Virgin Mary has been recognized in the Filipinos' approach to Jesus, no. That's why we have this 
uh, although it's not uniquely Filipino, the, the ad Jesum per Mariam to Jesus through Mary, it reminds us that although we approach Mary, we have Marian devotions. The ultimate goal of every Marian devotion is to lead us to Christ. No? And uh, that's even the goal of our pueb being a Pueblo Amante de Maria. Yes, we are a people in love with Mary or loving Mary. But that love should not end with Mary, but should end to her son. No? And that is what uh, has sustained us through all these centuries of our Christian faith. No? Uh, in, in the time when uh, born-again Christianity was flourishing, no? and one of the, the style of that is to ask Catholics uh, to, to break or to get rid of their images, a lot of uh, those who are Catholics who are venturing into that, they had to stop and think twice before they can destroy the, the Marian image because the Marian image represents a mother that loves us. No? And uh, our Marian devotions are what has kept us Catholics through all these years. It has helped us remain Catholics through all these years. No? So I think that's one of the important role of our Marian devotion in terms of our Christianity in the Philippines. Very nice uh, way to put it, Sir Michael. Uh, and and uh, it's great that you have also emphasized no, the role of Mother Mary as the intercessor. No, that, uh, that you know, she is our way to Jesus Christ. No, and you also mentioned you know centuries old uh, tradition, uh, centuries uh, of, you know, uh, Filipinos keeping their faith alive. Uh, and until today, the Nuestra, the image of uh, the Nuestra Senora uh, de Guia is still there, 400, more than 400 uh, years old already. Uh, we have a question from Carlos Joaquin Garcia. Uh, he's asking, will it be restored? Or are there plans of uh, restoring the image? I'm sorry, but I cannot answer that because I do not belong to the parish. No, because I think uh, the the issue of restoration will be a decision uh, that can be recommended by the parish and mm -hmm. with the approval of the Archbishop of Manila. Because there is a law, uh, there is a provision in the canon law that. Uh, venerated and uh, antique images that have been the subject of public veneration before it is restored should have the necessary permission of the local ordinary or the archbishop of the place. So, uh, And of course, uh, when we speak of restoration, uh, it will entail a lot. No, They have to, of course, examine first the image no? to see how it can be properly restored, etc. So, well, maybe time will come when it will have to be restored, but that will be a decision that the Archdiocese Shrine and Parish of Ermita will have to uh, consider uh, with the approval of the Archbishop of Manila and, of course, in consultation with the experts in the field of restoration. Yes. Personally, sir, what do you think? Uh, because uh, you mentioned that Huesa Senora de Guia is one of the oldest uh, and still enduring Marian images uh, in the country. Uh, do you think that it's fitting? Do you think it's, uh, it's a great time um, for the image to undergo restoration? I think uh, it should first undergo what we can call examination no? to see okay. how fragile it has become no? and uh, and then from there, maybe uh, make the decision if it will really have to undergo restoration. And sometimes what we fear when we have an image restored is that uh, will the people will still be able to recognize it you know, as uh, the one original? Because although... Uh, we can say it's just an image. No, any other image will still be able to represent Our Lady. But you know the history, the devotion that has been attached to the image through the centuries 
is something also worth considering, no? Because later on, after the restoration, if they're not able to to recognize the same image, no, I don't know how it will impact also the devotion. But naturally, it should not because uh, you know, we're saying it's just a representation of Our Lady, no? Uh, of course, Our Lady is far greater than all the other images that she have around the world and in the country. Yes, indeed. Um, and how do, how should we uh, how should we view uh, the the Nuestra Señora de Guia today? And I'm asking this, sir, because as we know, we are in uncertain times. Um, uh, we have the uh, we have the uh, you know pandemic. You no, know, it's it's still enduring. Uh, we are about to enter a consequential election. Uh, you know, in you know, in a month or a little more over a month, how should we view um, the devotion to Nuestra Señora de Guia during this time? I think uh, that the title no, that she has, Guia, no, means a lot for us. No, and in the reflections that I have seen, that were, for example, there is this one. Uh, homily uh, sermon preached in the 1700s at the Church of Ermita. It was uh, made by a, a, recollect, a recollectos. No? Uh, she focused, she mentioned, he mentioned also on the title Gia, no? which means guide. No? <clears throat> and uh, she had the title because of the affiliation or the relationship as patroness of the galleons. No? And we know that when you are in a voyage, when you are sailing in the, the wide sea no? or ocean, uh, mariners would only have the, the star as the guide. No? The, I think it's the North Star that they call. No? And that's why one of the titles also of Our Lady is Stella Maris, Star of the Sea. Because when you are in the big, big ocean, you only have the star to guide you to safety and to, to the port. No? And that has been our situation as uh, Christians. No? Uh, we are in a voyage. No? In, in fact, no, if you speak of church structure, when you speak of the body of the church, you call, the, you call it in English nave. No? Nave, that's where the people are located in the church. No? Of course, the other part is the sanctuary. And the word nave came from the Latin word nave, which means ship or boat. No? So it is a reminder for us that in our Christian life, we are in a voyage. We are not, uh, when you are in a boat, the boat is not your house, but you are traveling from one place to another. And that other place is the house of the Father, no? to which Jesus is leading us. No? And in that journey in a boat, our, one of the lights that guide us is Our Lady, the Stella Maris. No? And uh, at the start of the pandemic in, in March 2020, in his special Urbe et Orbe message of Pope Francis, he also likened our journey, the whole world, that we are in a boat um, sailing over this against this typhoon no? or this uh, disaster called uh, COVID-19. No? And we are hopefully sailing in one direction and hopefully we'll be able to, to pass through this uh, or, and overcome this struggle. No? And COVID-19 is just one representation of the struggle that we have to go through life. Now we are facing this challenge of electing new leaders for our country. No? And hopefully Our Lady will guide us no? in our discernment as we choose our leader, whoever will be the rightful leader for our country. Hopefully Our Lady will be able to serve as a guide for all of us. And, and so on. No? And whatever uh, challenge, whether personal, communal, uh, that face us, confronts us as uh, Christians, no? we have Our Lady to look to, to, to guide us no? in our journey through life. Thank uh, you. Very beautiful words. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
uh, you you mentioned Stella Stella Maris no napakagandang an yan yung uh, the first thing that comes to mind of course it, for the younger generation myself included would be that song composed by uh, Father Manoling Francisco yeah, Sight yeah. of Jesus right uh, very very wonderful song uh, we have this uh, okay we have quite a long message here on uh, on on our Zoom conference for those who are uh, watching us uh, uh, live on Facebook uh, we have so John Bryant the uh, the our audience member who asked earlier so uh, we ha- I'll, I'll try to split his uh, message into two parts so here's the first part I'm, I'll, I'll read it for you sir Mike no I have learned from a different lecture he says that the image of Nuestra Señora de Guía was seen by the locals as a provider for their needs while the Spanish saw this image as a justification for their conquest, as noted on how the image was discovered. What do you think, sir, makes this image more appealing to the locals considering that difference in the perception you know, between the locals and the Spanish? That's a sort of a tough question. No? And of course, I can only <clears throat> share uh, my insights on that. No? I think, well, looking at the features of the image, uh, actually the image of Nuestra Señora de Guía is considered one of the, what we call dark or black images of Our Lady. Now, of course, uh, we have another image uh, in Batangas, in Taal, the Nuestra Señora de Caizasay. And of course, the Virgin of Antipolo has also a dark skin. Uh, the Our Lady of Piat in Cagayan also has a, a dark skin, and I think also the Nuestra Señora de la Regla in Cebu. No? And, and for us Filipinos, no, of course, being a Moreno or a Morena will, will show us that that person is one with us. And the same goes for the Nazareno of Quiapo. No? Although he is called the Black Nazarene, uh, the image is not actually black. It's more of a moreno, no? Uh, kabalat Pinoy, no? Kabalat ng Filipino. And I think that's what uh, uh, also attracted the, the natives, no? Aside from, of course, the, the miraculous occurrences that they have encountered uh, with the image, no? As, as mentioned in the Annales Ecclesiasticos, no? They tried to remove her, but she would always go back to the place. Now, of course, uh, from the Spaniards, no, uh, because for the natives who did not know the Virgin Mary, this is just maybe one of their idols, no. But for the Spaniards, no, uh, and as I mentioned, no, uh, maybe it's that that uh, it's that eye of faith that has made them sort of uh, realize that this could be an image of Our Lady, no. Uh, of course, we, we are not privy to how they think, how they really concluded with that. No? But uh, I think in one account, it was mentioned that one of the missionaries uh, identified it as uh, the image of Our Lady. How the missionary came to that conclusion, there is no explanation. But of course, if you are a missionary far away from your motherland, no, you would always try to see the hand of God how the hand of God has been leading you in, in your uh, challenging mission into a foreign land, no? like the Philippine archipelago. No? And maybe that's why they were able to see the image as a representation of Our Lady. No? And, and, and with that, they're able to put it together and, of course, uh, help catechize the natives towards the Christian faith because they're already attracted to this image, no? identifying it, no, as an uh, image of Our Lady will help facilitate the evangelization. And in, in my uh, knowledge of Christian, uh, history of Christianity, no, uh, they would say that there are only two reactions of the early Christians to paganism. First is to get away with it, get rid of it, no? But the other is to Christianize a pagan practice if it will be helpful to the evangelization. And I think one example that is, uh, has been mentioned uh, time and again would be Christmas Day. No? You would hear 
non-Catholics tell Catholics, no? Why do you celebrate Christmas on December 25? It's we don't really know the actual birthday of Jesus, no? If if you look at Bethlehem, it's it's cold during that time. So uh, why will there be shepherds in the meadows, no? But going back to the history of that Christian uh, feast of uh, Christmas, we know that the history of that is the it's the pagan celebration of the Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun. No? And when they try to Christianize this pagan feast, they are saying the unconquerable sun is not the planet sun or not that sun that you worship, but it's really the son of God, Jesus Christ. And I think that's in a way what happened to the image of the Nuestra Señora de Guilla, to be able to... Uh, also be part of the evangelization of the Philippines during that time. Thank you. Okay. And uh, John Bryant also adds, on another note regarding his previous question, now po, I've known, he says, from Evergisto Bazacos, History of Education in the Philippines, that parochial schools existed as early as the 17th century most of which were run by early missionaries. Ayon. So, yun pala yun, sir. Kaya thank you, pala, for, thank you yes, for sharing that. Because as I said, I'm only reliant on the, the what was said in the, the souvenir program. Of course, if there are other parochial schools that existed, uh, we can always uh, be open to that. Yeah. Uh, siguro pang huli na lang, uh, Sir Mike, no? Am I correct, sir, because I was um, trying to look up information about uh, the Nuestra Señora de Guia. Am I correct, sir, that uh, she is the patroness of, uh, of overseas Filipino workers? Well, right now, I think that is what maybe what we can say as uh, the new patronage. You know, because we don't have galleons anymore. No, uh, One thing that can relate to the devotion to the Nuestra Señora de Guia is really the, the OFWs that we have. And in fact, in the compound of the parish, no, I think there is a lodging that they offer to, especially to mariners, no, to those who are what we call the seamen. No? Uh, for example, if they need to, they need a place to stay in Manila before they um, get aboard their ship no for their work or maybe when they arrive no i think uh, it's a place where they can stay temporarily until they board the ship or they go home to their family in the province so in in a way there is really that connection because of the galleons and uh, the navigators and uh, OFW not only OFW but well part of the OFW would be the seaman no those who would be working in ships. Yes. So there is that uh, patronage also for them. Yes, that's great. And then, you know, this is, I guess that would also be, you know, an, an, uh, an open invitation for, uh, for our uh, audience members here, students, employees who may have family members, uh, loved ones who are working abroad, uh, that they may also be invited to deepen uh, their devotion uh, to the Nuestra Señora de Guia. Before we let you go, Sir Mike, any final words? So, first of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity. No, uh, I think this is the first time that I am able to share uh, this unknown uh, part of the history of the Nuestra Señora de Guia. Of course, many people know about her pontifical coronation, but it has never been, been mentioned that it happened during the time of the Capuchins. No? And not only the coronation, but I think the coronation is just the culmination of their work in the Ermita Parish. But uh, the most important is uh, the return of the image no, from Manila Cathedral to Ermita Church, where uh, she is rightly the patroness of the place. No? So I really thank and now that I heard that this is the last of the webinar, so I'm happy that uh, I was able to make habol no, in, with this presentation. No, because right now I'm thinking of writing a book about the Nuestra Señora de Guia, and definitely this will be part of it. No, but 
it would be good to have this venue also to share it already, especially to those who are involved or related or working with the Capuchins, no? because this is one of the lesser known contributions, I think, for, for about the Capuchins. No? So thank you very much. And thank you for the question. As for that parochial school uh, information, thank you also because it was not the intention of the research, so that's why I just took the information. But of course, the history of parochial schools in the Philippines will, will have to be looked into because that's another aspect of evangelization. And I think what is good is that we know that the Capuchins are also involved in that as also part of the, the legacy of the Lordetian schools. No? I have uh, colleagues here in Xavier who came either from Mandaluyong or Quezon City. No? So it would be good to, to have that uh, knowledge about the legacy of the Capuchins in the country. So thank you very much for this opportunity.